Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk on uh, effortlessly implementing production grade applications uh, architectures with Spring. Uh, my name is Adeep Saikali. I'm part of the uh, Tanzu application uh, platform R&D team and also part of the Azure Spring Apps Enterprise R&D team. So I work on both uh, technologies. I'm Asa from Microsoft, on point for everything developers like you need for building, migrating, and scaling Java apps on Azure. I'm also a Java dev. Uh, I started in 1995 with JDK1. It's been about 28 years, having a ton of fun. Very happy to see you all. So today, one of the things we brought here is uh, a collection of our 2018 t-shirts with so you can have it at the end of the session today. Okay, we'll leave it here. So we have like four hours worth of content for 45 minutes. <laughs> Are you all excited to watch us talk really fast and demo things really fast? <laughs> all right, excellent. So if we're going way too fast, just raise your hand and say, can you repeat that or slow us down? Welcome questions at any time. Don't wait till the end, okay? So um, the first question we are asking about, we promised to talk about production grade application architecture, which raises the question, what does a production grade application architecture mean? Does it mean that you use reactive? Does it mean that you implemented an API? Does it mean you use the message queue? Oh, does it mean you made it web scale and use one of those uh, fancy NoSQL databases on the cloud? Who says that's what production means? No, we all know that's not true. Uh, when we talk about production grade, we're actually talking about three very boring things. Number one, is your application operable? Do you get called late at night on the weekend to fix an issue with an application? Or when there's an issue, you don't know what's going on, and then lots of people get on a conference call and you try to figure out why something isn't working. The second thing is, is your application secure? And the third thing is, is your application elastic? Now, what do I mean by those three words? So I want to take a few minutes to tell you our perspective on what those three things mean. And uh, then we're going to look at how we can do those things very easily with Spring and some other things that we're going to talk about today. So what exactly does an operable architecture mean? Uh, an operable architecture boils down to uh, a few concepts. Concept number one is that it's observable, right? Um, who here likes to know what their system is doing? All right, how many people here have used Micrometer? Raise your hand. All right, how many people here are Spring developers? Just to make sure. If you're not a Spring developer, <laughs> welcome to the Spring <laughs> developer conference, the Spring one. Um, the second thing is structured logs. And uh, how many people here don't know what structured logs means? Like you'd love to see, no, what are you talking about, Adib? Who like, knows exactly what I mean by structured logs? Raise your hand. All right. Most of you just don't want to admit what you know and don't know. I get it. <laughs> uh, distributed traces, health checks. So we're going to talk a little bit about those. But I think that part of operable is fairly well understood. So we're going like, to go really fast on that. The second thing is things are configurable. We all know hard-coded values are bad. OK, if they're bad, what are you going to replace them with? Well, I'd like to replace them with something that's externalized, so the configuration is outside the application. I'd like this thing to be versioned, so I can go forwards in time and backwards in time to previous uh, versions. I'd like it to be auditable, to so know who changed what setting. And I'd like it to be centralized, so I don't have to change the same setting in like 50 different places. right? The next thing is it's got to be automatable. And that one we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about because that could be its own like five-day course, so to speak. But essentially, the key thing is that you need to have some way of making sure that what you're doing is completely rebuildable from scratch. That's what we mean by repavable. Like if I went and I deleted your whole entire deployment minus the database, like the actual data of the database, how long does it take you to bring it back? Or let's say your, uh, your data was running in one data center, your application, and that data center burns down, and you're launching it in a new data center. Can you do it and end up bit for bit identical to what, what was there somewhere else, right? Uh, that it has to be repairable, so it's easy to repair, and it has to be repeatable. So if you run the same pipeline twice, the same thing twice, do you get the same result? Or are you in a situation where, you know, who remembers Log4j? Shell, right? Were you asked by your bosses, and then you went to rerun the pipeline for something, and raise your hand if the pipeline was broken? 
didn't quite do what it was supposed to do. The Jenkins servers changed. Something was different, right? So it has to be repeatable. And then lastly, this is my favorite one. It has to be contractual. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that I don't want to wait on other people. I don't want to have to say, can I deploy this now? Oh, no, you can't. Why can't I do it? Some other team is going to break because you need to coordinate with them. Who hates coordination with other teams? So operable <laughs> architectures are ones where they are designed so that you don't need an explicit contract with someone else. You can just go ahead and redeploy, which means you're going to need to do all the best practices you've learned from software engineering to make that happen. So that's what I, we mean by operable architecture. We want to look today at how you can get those things effortlessly and easily. So the next thing we want to talk about is what is a secure architecture? Uh, secure architecture, from my perspective, boils down to some boring things again. So number one is you have secure communication path, you know, good old TLS and SSL and all of that. We're not going to spend too much time on this because a lot of the networking is typically not something you do as a developer, right? The other stuff on the previous slide is things you do yourself. Uh, you have to handle secrets securely. You don't want secrets like kind of stored in text files everywhere. Uh, you definitely want to be using some sort of external single sign-on service of some kind, but you don't want to burden your own code with what I call the really annoying if statement that checks if the application is running on your laptop, then use the fake database of users. But if it's running in production, use the, re the real database, right? Who has that in their code? Anybody? <laughs> I've seen that in a lot of places. Um, and then it has to be auto-patchable, so it's always continuously patched. You don't have to think about, uh, oh, can I safely patch this now? There's a new CVE. It's done. It's patched. And I absolutely don't like passwords, so we really want to promote getting rid of passwords everywhere, wherever we can. Um, and lastly, what do we mean by elastic? Okay, that's not going to surprise you too much. It's the idea that your application, you've architected it in a way that you can go from no instances running to an almost infinite number of instances. And once you have a number of instances running, you can go back all the way down to zero. So the scale from zero to a high number and the scale back to zero is something you have to think about how to do in your application. Now, luckily, because you're using Spring, this is kind of easy because you have to worry about state and a bunch of other stuff, which we'll talk about. The other thing is, like, can you also vertically scale? If I give you more memory, can you use it? If you give you more CPU, can you use it? And the reason why we like this, like, we like this term adaptive co cost control. Um, a lot of customers I work with, one customer in particular, I like, spend lots of time getting data from their internal systems. It was 27% of, uh, of these 400 apps, like all the resources, was non-prod. So think of a bill for 7,000 virtual machines when 27% is production. How much money can you save if you reduce the ratio of uh, production to non-prod, right? Non-production doesn't make you any money, but why do you have to have it all around, right? So we want to we want to really get to that, that the elastic for me really means that adaptive cost control, which will make you a hero in your company if you can actually show them how to save money. Okay. So now that we talked about kind of what do we mean by production grade architecture, how do you go about actually making it happen? And this is where there's this really interesting interplay between three things. There is you, all right? That's represented by like the stick people. There's Java which is the code that you're writing in Spring. But you're not just writing everything yourself, right? You're depending on a framework, the Spring ecosystem, Spring Boots, from Spring Framework, which is in turn also interacting with some sort of platform. So to get those properties, to get to the effortless part, the question is, what do you do in your code? What, do you, what does the framework do? And what does the platform do? Does that make sense to folks? What is the right balance for these things? So what we're, gonna, what we're going to explore with you today is assuming that your platform is Kubernetes and assuming that you have one of Azure Spring Apps Enterprise or Tanzu Application Platform, what are these elements of these production-grade architectures that become easier or harder? What are the pros and cons of different things? So we're going to show you some demos really quick. We're going to talk a lot about like pros and cons, and please ask questions as we go along. So raise your hand if this looks interesting for you today. 
And if it's not, now is your chance to leave. <laughs> and we'll just chuck a t-shirt at you. No. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, so just to recap for those who may not know what is Tanzu Application Platform, uh, I'll explain it by its guiding philosophy. It's like you're a developer, you're basically saying, here's my code, run it in Kubernetes for me, I really don't care how, I'm a developer. But there's somebody in my company, the platform engineers, that care. The platform team cares how your code is running. Uh, this is, uh, has first class support for Spring. It's been around since 2022. And um, it runs on any Kubernetes. AKS, GKE, EKS, Tenzu Kubernetes Grid, OpenShift, uh, probably runs on Docker Desktop if you give it enough resources. Um, and the second platform we're talking about is Azure Spring Apps, where it's like, here's my code, run it on Azure. I don't care how. I don't want to operate anything. Let Microsoft do that for me. That's been around for a while, and it has amazing uh, support for Spring. And so what I want to preview now is kind of like, OK, how are we going to do this? What are the demos and different pros and cons conversations we're going to have? We're going to start with a very quick uh, uh, look at observability and how those are handled. Then we're going to look at how do you do centralized configuration. Who here is familiar with Spring Cloud Config? All right, excellent. Who's never heard of application configuration service? OK, come on. You all have heard of it? Oh my goodness, really? Oh, I doubt it. OK, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about how health checks can be automatically created without you having to even think about it. Uh, we're going to then move on to like, how do you make it so that you never have to get asked about things like Log4j shell ever again. Uh, we'll talk about single sign-on, uh, how to externalize your secrets and hand handle them correctly, how to do passwordless, like literally get rid of passwords. Like you want to talk to a database, you don't need a password to open a secure connection to that database. Who would like that? Would that make your pipeline simpler? Yeah. Because you wouldn't have to have like environment variable settings for the pipeline to go all this. So we'll, we'll talk about the patterns for that. Um, and then we're going to get into the elastic stuff like scaling to zero and then scaling to infinity. And we'll have, if we have time, we'll have a short discussion on the pros and cons of, you know, crack, native, and JIT, right? Very short discussion because I doubt that we'll get to the last one. All right, so that is where we're at. So, Asher, it's all yours. Sure. So we have a lot of demos, so we're going to rush as fast as we can. Okay? So you're going to see that too, yeah. So this is traditional logging, right? You see that it's just printing out everything in a single line. Right? Now, you can structure that. You can configure a log back and put it in your application and you will see that in action, right? So I'll show you uh, quickly. Uh, uh, so just one, one thing. Mm -hmm. Did everybody notice there's a git commit ID at the bottom? Who's looked at a log file before and you're like, I don't know what version of the code generated this? You go to the line number and it's like a comment, like what? <laughs> that helps you avoid that. Right. So here is an example of how you configure that, right? I'm assuming most of you are familiar with this kind of configuration, right? All right. So let me get into uh, how many of you attended the keynote? So you're all familiar with this application then, right? So this is the application that we're going to use and go behind it and looking at how it is observable, right? So. Okay, so we showed you the log. So the apps are running right here in Azure Spring Apps Enterprise. So the first thing I want to show you here is the application map, right? So we talked a lot about the we talked a lot about the distributor tracing. So it picks up the distributor tracing and it's able to put all your app estate in one single pane and connect them all together. So if you see here, uh, the identity, the payment, the catalog, you saw the catalog of bikes showing up there. And the catalog talks to a Postgres database behind the scene, right? Like, uh, so you can see all of, all of. Before they ask, I have a question, Astro. What did you have to do in your Java app, in your Spring app for this? Nothing at all. I just deployed and uh, it auto configured. Now, if you don't want this, you can turn it off. Yeah. Right? So, 
remember that triangle where we had code, your code, platform, and framework? Framework plus platform does this for you transparently. Thus, right. it is effortless, right? What you got to focus on is picking the right metrics to expose with micrometer. So now when I click on it, it'll get me where the calls are. These are the calls that went into the database. I can actually investigate its performance. And from there, I can get in, drill into one of the samples here. Now when I drill, what happens is it gives you the complete end-to-end -end very quickly. Right? So if I pick this up, you would see the complete end-to-end -end transaction. Right? And you would see exactly what command was sent by your Spring Data JPA into, right? So, sign in, that's okay. I think what happens is uh, from the network, right, it actually tethers. Um, <laughs> it's the network thing, don't worry. Um, I have a backup screen, so it should be okay. <laughs> So what happened there was because I walked into this network from the speaker's room, it changed to another network and it was asking me to sign in again. But I have another screen here. So you can see here, uh, when I look at the performance, I can look at by operations. Uh, I can also look at by dependencies. You can see all the dependencies here. You can see one of the calls we made about a few million calls, right? A quarter billion calls. And you can see the number of milliseconds it took, right? So I can also look at the exceptions that happened, right? And the very important thing here is when I go into these exceptions, I can click on it and I can pick up this exception and you can see exactly what happened right here, right? You don't have to search for them. Again, I didn't have to do anything. It's automatically got fired up, right? Um, so let me also show you one of the queries that I ran as well. So here, you can also run queries and all the logs are here. Um, as soon as you run the queries, all the logs are here and you can customize this query depending on what job you're trying to do. Here I'm looking at all the app logs that are coming out and you can see as long as they're structured, they are broken down just like the way here, right? I can also, uh, look at the system log. System logs in this specific case, it's the components like configuration service, application configuration services right here. You can actually look at it, right? Um, okay, so with that, let me come back to, come back to the deck. So a key thing here is that you have an observability platform, whatever that is, right? In this case, we showed you Azure with ASAE. Correct. So we'll switch now to the next topic, which is your configuration service. Yeah, all right, I'll do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to centralized configuration, especially on your platform, who's had this debate internally? Should we use config maps or should we use Spring Cloud Config? Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look and review the two different approaches that you can have in a, a Spring environment on a platform. So in the classic Spring Cloud uh, config, which has been around for wow, wow, almost 10 years, I think, um, you have your applications. They wake up. They connect to the Spring Cloud config server. They say, hello, I am the customer profile service. Can you please give me my configuration? And the Spring Cloud config is able to get that configuration from a Git repository, uh, from a database, from another config server, um, from the file system. And the really great thing about the config service server is it lets you get those three, four things we talked about for uh, an operable architecture. You're externalizing the configuration out of the application where you're deploying it. You're putting it, uh, you're centralizing it. It's versioned and it's audited, right? It's audited implicitly by, by being a config map, um, a Git repo. So the pros of that are number one is you have the version history, it's pluggable, it runs locally, you can run it on your laptop, you don't need a, a Kubernetes cluster for it. Uh, it doesn't depend on Kubernetes, stores configurations in multiple places. Um, the configuration is outside the Kubernetes cluster, so it's implicitly backed up because you have it in a Git repo. Um, and it has a hierarchy, right? So you can, for example, let's say you have the common set of settings across 10 services. With Spring Cloud Config, you can actually put that common setting 
in a root configuration, and then you don't have to repeat yourself in 10 different places. Who was aware of the hierarchy before? Raise your hand. Who is new to the hierarchy? It's a pretty cool feature. It's one of my favorite features of Spring Cloud Config. It really makes it possible for you to like kind of create your uh, complex test scenario, uh, integration test uh, scenarios. The cons are if the Spring Cloud Config server is not running, what's going to happen to your app when it tries to start? It's dead, right? You can't start. And um, you have to talk to it with the REST API, which isn't really hard, but some folks are like, I, only, I have more than Spring. I have Spring and I have Python or C Sharp or something. And they want more like a, a common way to handle polyglot situations. So they say, oh, this thing is not polyglot, even though it is. It's just the REST API, right? So that's one approach. The second approach, if you're not doing the config server, is you do Kubernetes config maps or secrets. So in the case of config maps, you can see it's just a YAML file with some properties on it and the data section. If it's a secret, you know, you kind of create it typically with the command line. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But to get your head around it, what you have to understand is that all of your configuration settings, in the case of Kubernetes, are stored in the Kubernetes etcd control plane database. So, and then they're made available to your application uh, via the Kubernetes YAML. So the, let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of this. The pros are your app, if it starts, it's got its configuration. <laughs> like, there's no possible confusion about like, your app ever starting it without its configuration because if the API server was down and the etcd server was down, trust me, your app won't start. <laughs> There'll be no pod. Um, so it's also programming language neutral uh, in that lots of programming languages other than Java have support for config maps and secrets. And it has insanely amazing integration out of the box with Spring Boot. Right? So as a Spring developer, you can leverage both the config server or config maps and secrets. The cons of it is you can only store the latest version of something. Like there is no previous version of the config map that's stored in the API server that you can access. So you'd have to version it outside. If somebody changed the setting, hmm, who changed it? Why did it change? Uh, you, developers have to be familiar with Kubernetes. You may not have a Kubernetes cluster locally on your, uh, on your laptop. Um, and um, you know, it does require access to the API server. Um, so, you know, there are, and I'm going to go through all the, the pros and cons. So this is just a summary slide of all of those. Um, I'm not going to go through that. But I'm going to ask this question. What if there was a way for you to get all of the benefits of the Spring Cloud config server without any of the cons, okay? And all of the benefits of the Kubernetes config map without of the cons. Does that make sense? What if you get the best of both worlds? That is what we do with something called the application configuration service. So I'm going to switch to my laptop here. Mm -hmm. yes. And all right, we'll, we'll go a little bit bigger here. Can folks see this? All right. So what I've got is. So this is a repo with a Git repository with just settings that you would be familiar with. It doesn't really matter what those settings are. This is the equivalent of what you, have, you would have the Spring Cloud config talk to. And then what you do is you start by defining to Kubernetes what's called a configuration source. And you can see here, I've told it the type is Git. And I've told it that where the Git repository is and which branch to look on that Git repo. Does that make sense to folks? Now, I need to instruct uh, the application configuration service and say, can you please go pick up this information from this Git repo and turn it for me into a config map? And that's what we do with these things called Slices, so uh, doo -doo -doo. 
So you can see, for example, here that there's this thing called the configuration slice. And I'm telling it to go to this particular Git repo and refresh every 30 seconds, check if there's new values. And then um, I'm telling it how to handle, uh, when it sees a secret, how to, how to deal with that. And so I define a bunch of these things. And when I define them, and I go and I look in my namespace after I deploy the application, you'll see there's a whole bunch of config maps that were made for me by the application configuration service. Does that make sense to folks? So we have this Kubernetes operator with a custom Kubernetes extension, which will mimic the behavior of the Spring Cloud config service. But then once you have it in a config map, you can use the standard Kubernetes approach of mounting the config map as a tree. And then you use the Spring Boot config tree setting. Who's used Spring Boot config tree? Who's never seen Spring Boot config tree? Oh, boy. OK, I'll show you that. <laughs> I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that real quick then. So we go to. Um, Do I have that already here? Yeah. Oh, actually, I might have it in this other one. Oh, that other one is not responding. Uh, yeah. All right, I'm just going to describe it. It's going to take me too long. We're going to miss on the other demos. So what you do with the config tree, you can actually tell Spring Boot there's a directory, and the directory has configuration settings. And it will just parse that directory, parse all the subtrees in it, all the subdirectories, and use that to form your Spring Cloud, your Spring Boot configuration. Does that kind of make sense? So point is, all you do is you just tell your Spring application, this is where stuff is, and, and you're done. Actually, it may be in, let me just check something. It may actually be in the workload YAML here. Uh, Where's the web crawler? It's pretty hard to. Yeah, here you go. Basically, what you have is you, you add this particular thing, which, which says, go look in this directory, and I will parse that subdirectory for all the settings. OK? So that is the story of, let's go back to the other machine? Mm -hmm. OK, so that's just visually representing that. So if you are on Azure Spring Apps Enterprise, you have access to this functionality. So in that case, you would use the Azure CLI to say AZ Spring Configuration Service Git Repo Add. And it behaves exactly the same way as if you're on Kubernetes. So who's, who's liking this configuration service idea? Who's like, nah, you're taking Spring Cloud Config from my cold dead hands? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so this was. All right, uh, you're doing this one, right? All right, yeah. yeah. So, how many of you like patching your applications or your container images? Oh, there's one person there. So, you know, this, for the server side software, there's an unceasing barrage of updates coming through. Every 20 minutes, a new CV is released, and most of them apply to the server side. Right? This can include the operating system, the Kates, the JDK, APM, application libraries, everything that is used to run the server software. And these updates are released by the respective vendors to fix bugs or patch security and introduce new features. And you have to update them. And there is a rhythm. You can see the rhythm described there. Some things are happening monthly. Some things are happening quarterly. Some things are happening in a few weeks. So if you are patching them, you probably have to patch every week to keep things up to date. And this can take a lot of time, right? Installing, making sure nothing goes wrong. And some things will just break apart. And you will have to take care of it, right? So what are the challenges with those patching? 
it's the volume and the coordination these are the biggest nightmare some of the things your scanner can scan your images scan your code and pick up and maybe your platform team can patch the patch the os right but what about patching the container image where if there's a change in jdk if there's change in apm change in operating systems level libraries change in the host os um, how can you do that without coordination? So you have to coordinate with the app team. And if you are the app team, you have to coordinate with the platform team. So this can be a showstopper and it can take a plenty of time, right? Now imagine if there are so many teams, so many DevOps teams have to do all of those things. So imagine the challenges with volume and, and volume and the coordination involved here. So this is where you can really get tired because of the never-ending cycle. First, the updates are time-consuming. Second, they are too frequent. And some introduce bugs, and some will take your systems down. And many of the employees won't even understand why they are doing it right? uh, and the importance of it. So this is where uh, one of the key principles that we talk about is the auto-patchable. Right? Um, so you can break the endless cycle. right? The way you break is you focus on the app code, your app dependencies. Any changes that need to be done, you do it and you take care of it. And the platform will take care of everything underneath the green line. Right? And this happens because the, the container images are built in a way that they are auto-patchable. Um, I think you're going to explain yeah. a little let's, more let's detail. Let's look at right? what you have to do this. Who's like, yeah, it would be great if I didn't have to ever patch anything. So I have bad news for you. In order to do this, you have to be willing to give up control. Has anybody ever programmed in C or C++? Did you enjoy malloc and free? <laughs> <laughs> you gave up control of memory management when you came to Java. So if you want patching to become something you don't care about, you have to give up control of two things, containerizing the code and the creation of Kubernetes manifests. Why is that? Because if you delegate the containerization of code to the platform, when there's a CVE, the platform can automatically rebuild your container image. But when you rebuild your container image, there is a new container image ID that you need to tell Kubernetes about. So if you wrote the Kubernetes YAML yourself, you'd have to go and edit the Kubernetes YAML file to tell it which new version of the container to run. Does that make sense to people? However, if you give up control of both containerization and creation of Kubernetes manifests, you gain this magical ability to auto-patch. So I'm going to switch to my laptop. I'm going to show you how we do that in Tenzo application platform. Uh, 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 let me figure out how to do the proper zoom. OK. So when you run on something like Tenzo Application Platform, what you write is what we call a simple workload YAML. So let's take a look at that, what this workload YAML looks like. So here's my workload YAML that's actually associated with that supply chain. Um, I told that there is code located in this Git repository on this branch called main. So let's just visit this code to prove I'm not doing anything bad. There's no Docker file here anywhere. So I have given up control of containerization to the platform. And in return, the platform is going to uh, run through a supply chain and this thing here called image provider or AKA Tanzu Build Service, AKA Build Packs, AKA KPAC, is going to take my code and is going to turn it into a container image. Has anybody here used Spring Boot Build Image on uh, Maven? That's exactly what this does, but it does it at industrial scale. Okay? In fact, that's what I love about Spring Boot is that on the command line on your laptop, you can go Spring Boot Build Image, get exactly the same behavior as you would on Tap. By the way, on Azure Spring Apps, when you deploy your application, guess how it works? Build packs, same thing. It's exactly the same thing that you do when you do Spring Boot build image, uh, the same as when you do Spring Boot 
um, or when you do uh, Tanzu uh, workload create, or the same thing when you do AZ deploy. So, but it goes a step further than that. This is going to be, be, okay, great. So you figured out, you created a container image, but then after you create the container image, it's going to go through a process of applying, um, uh, inspecting what kind of application you are. So for a Spring Boot application, how do you configure health checks on Kubernetes? Who's familiar with that? What would you use? Starts with an A? Anybody want to? Actuator. Actuator, all right, you're right. So this thing here is going to go through a process of identifying that this is a Spring Boot application, running what's called a convention service on it, and the result is going to be something that looks like this in this case. So let's look at this Kubernetes YAML. So this YAML was generated from the supply chain, and in this case it generated a Knative service. Whether you know what Knative is or not doesn't matter. The point is you, the developer, didn't write this. Your platform engineer configured the Tenzo application platform to do this for you. But as you go through this one here, you'll notice that it applied a Spring Boot convention auto configure actuator check. It checked to see if the container image had a Spring Boot application and had actuators turned on. Um, it also applied the graceful shutdown uh, feature of Spring Boot. Who knows how to use that on Kubernetes? Okay, who does, who's never heard of Graceful Shutdown on Spring Boot? It's okay to admit you never heard it. The point is you should never need to know about that, <laughs> right? The platform should just do it for you. So in this case, when you look down at like what it's doing, it's launching your Java application and it's automatically taking those probes, the actuator uh, things, and it's making sure that they're exposed in a secure way. And it's also, um, you know, um, turning on graceful shutdown and it's correctly configuring, oops, it's correctly configuring the liveness probe and the health probe and all of that and you never had to know anything about that as a developer. So this thing can write better Kubernetes YAML than, me, than I can or anyone else that I've ever seen. Because it's a robot, doesn't get tired, doesn't make typos, doesn't mess up with the indentation of the YAML, you know? <laughs> so, um, uh, so that's how we do it there. I'm switch back, and Astra is going to take you through how we do this on ASA. Uh, we're going back. Oh, you went back to presentation log. Oh, go to the demo. Yes. Ah, you're on the demo one. Right. So on Azure Spring Apps, when you're deploying, all of these are automatic. You don't have to do anything at all when you deploy. The service bytes itself will auto patch every six weeks, and it'll also have flash updates. So in case there are something that need to be pushed, it will be automatically pushed. And you can update your app code anytime you want. So I'll just quickly show you one example. When the log4j came, right? Uh, we were in full action with all our partners, whether Dynatrace, AppDynamics, Neuralic, VMware. We all built quickly, and we patched the bottom, right, wherever it needed. And we also asked the customers if they were switching, right? If they had switched, quickly updated. Similarly, when the, there was a canonical open SSL exposure, right? Um, they released the update and we patched it and you didn't have to do anything at all. So I also wanted on a time check, there's only six more minutes, <gasps> right? So I wanted to ask you all um, so we can show you Auto scale and adaptive cost control. That's one we can show a demo. Um, we can show you um, passwordless connections. Um, we can show you single sign on. So, do you want to shout out what would you like to see? Passwordless. Passwordless. All right. It's very, very good demand for that. Yes. Yes. I like you guys. Let's do that, right? Um, so, passwordless. So I'm going to show you uh, an application here. So I have this uh, e-commerce application up and running right here, where you can, you can oh, oh, it hasn't switched yet. I need to go back and hold on. That's strange. It, it's here. Uh, it's my, I'm just have to navigate my icon. Oh. Where is my mouse? Oh, there it is. Oh, okay. you see it. I see right? it's happening. Okay, you have different. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's a, a, a Shopify's e-commerce site, right? You can see it. It's, it's powered and it's up and running. 
it is powered using a MySQL database behind the scene. Right? And I'll show you where it is deployed. It's actually deployed into Azure Spring Apps Enterprise. Can you make the fonts a little bit bigger? Yeah. I have to take it down and then do it, looks like. Right here, if I put, I think this should be readable. Right, it's good. So you can see the apps are deployed right here. And what I'm going to do is this one right here, this is a Spring Boot REST API. I'm going to drill into, into this one. So this is, the, this is the app, and each app has an identity. Just like the way you have an identity, like I have Asir and he has ID, we have an identity. The app also have as an identity. So here is the identity of the app. So this will have an entry in the directory system. So in Azure, if you're using it, it's Azure Active Directory, it will have an entry. From that entry, you can grant access to the target database. Yeah. Let, let, let me give you folks a very simple analogy. Who's got siblings? Brother, sister? All right. Who gave you your identity? Your parents picked a name, right? I like your name is Adib, you know, your sister, your brother's name is Michael, right? And then you're fighting over stuff and you're like, your identity in your house grants you access to different stuff, right? Based on the name that your parents gave you. So it's kind of like the same thing. In this case, Azure Spring Apps is the parent that created your application when it got deployed and Azure itself gave you an identity. When you so were born. When you were born as, a, as an entity inside of Azure, and because of that, your Azure is able to authenticate you and know who you are. Like This is like when your family sees you, you can't fool them and tell them you're somebody else. Or maybe if you're identical twins and like your parents can't tell you apart, but you get, you get folks together, what I mean by this? Okay. Yeah. So then once you have the identity, you call a service connection and say, please attach it to the database. So in this case, it's attaching to a Shopizer uh, MySQL database, right? And I, I can happily expose all of this because there's no secret. You see that? Uh, it, it says passwordless is enabled. And it gives you the URL and the username. And the username is the Active Directory username that was assigned to you. And it was all magically connected by a service connector request. You just say AZ Spring App Connection, and it automatically binds them for you, right? Now, I'll pictorially show you how, how this looks like as well, right? So if I go here, uh, this is the slide, right? If you look at this slide here, right, it's a Spring Boot app. You use a starter underneath the Spring Data JDBC, which then uses a driver. When you enable passwordless, right, it's trying to uh, first use the JDBC authentication plugin, go get the token from the directory. And this is all real time. It picks up the token and then the JDBC directory uh, driver uses the token to log into the resource database. It could be a database, it could be a cache, it could be a uh, Kafka, whatever systems that is, right? Example we are just showing you. So that way it, it operates. So ultimately to make this happen, there's no new code is written. There are no more passwords, no need to rotate passwords. That's very important, right? And underlying principle is Never trust, always verify, and credential free, and zero trust helps to secure all the communications by only tr trusting the machines or users after verifying identity and then granting them access to the backend. So you don't have to use password, you don't have to rotate password, you don't have to break your pipelines. And one thing our customers tell us is, hey, I changed my password, my system is down. Boom. Yeah. Right? They have to restart, they have to debug, nothing at all. So let's uh, do the closing then. Sure. Sorry, folks. We thought we had like we went from like five days of content down to what we thought was uh, four hours that we were going to rush through in forty-five minutes. Can we show <laughs> just the auto scales uh, uh, metrics no, alone? No, Don't no, running out of time. Let's yeah. just do the closing. Yes. All right. All right. So there it is. to kind of close it out, there are three central aspects that we talked about to make a production architecture. Um, uh, an, any application architecture production grade. Number one, it's operable. It's secure and it's elastic. And the key takeaway point 
in all of this is this interaction between what you do in your application code, what the framework does for you, and what the platform does. And as much as possible, it's best to push the concerns to the framework or the platform. Who's, who's like finding this framework helpful? Like this was new to you today, like thinking in, in these terms of what can I shift? And what can I give up control on and to get stuff? And, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Asra, you want to explain what this is? Yeah, so one of the things, uh, ma many of our customers, many of your developers, they are migrating their apps from on-prem to the cloud. But they are also hitting lots of problems. And the problems are from the ecosystem as a whole, right? So we want to know what those problems are. And we have a survey. You can scan it and fill up the survey. If you fill up the survey and you complete the survey, you get a nice socks at a booth. Go to the expo floor and you would see Azure Spring Apps uh, booth and you can get it. And there's also a raffle. We are giving out 28 stainless steel, steel cups. That's about $45 worth. And we're also giving a dozen, dozen uh, Microsoft earbuds. That's about $300 each. Right, so please do fill, help us. We are going to publish this as a report. It will be available to all of you. Uh, we want to publish this as a report. Uh, it will be anonymized, of course. It'll be, we want to publish the report so that everybody in the ecosystems can contribute to help you migrate your apps from on-prem to the, to the cloud. All right, thanks, everyone, for being here. If anybody's got any questions, well, stick around.